Stanford University. I just want to make a few opening remarks uh, to set the context for what you're going to hear today. Uh, Laura, the Director of Project Management, has been out talking within the community to explain how we're going to go about doing this, this project, this very innovative project. And the how piece is interesting because it's going to impact your daily life, and so we wanted to communicate around the how. But more importantly is why are we doing this? And so today, particularly for the engineering group, people interested in sustainability and energy management, we're taking a much broader approach. We did a presentation like this in the summer. It wasn't well attended, as you can imagine. But today, we hope to explain why we're doing this. And we think that's most important in today's discussion. And then towards the latter part, we can talk about how we're doing it and how it's going to impact your daily life. And hopefully, we'll minimize that. But um, so that, that's the kind of broad notion of what we want to talk about today. But I also want to say a couple, a couple other words. You know, uh, we've done, I think, a pretty good job of setting an example in the university communities about when we build new buildings, we should do it in a, in a, in a manner that is high performance building, not using the buzzwords of lead or any one policy that you glom onto, but frankly, look at the opportunities within that program and that building opportunity and optimize around a set of variables. And I think we've done a good job. Um, and that we started that in like 2001. And then in 2005, six, uh, we had uh, an opportunity to hire a really innovative individual in Joe Stagner. I think we hired you in 07, right, Joe? Yeah. So Joe comes to us uh, via UC Davis, UC Berkeley, ran their utility group. Um, and we had this central question, you know, what do we do with an aging central plant? Uh, a plant that was built in the 80s, innovative, uh, this cogeneration plant, which we'll talk about in a minute, Joe will. Um, what do we do with this aging thing? You know, with the contracts expiring with the company we have operating it, the equipment's old and tired, it's, you know, three generations ago uh, in its efficiency uh, uh, metrics. What do we do? Well, one answer is you hire Joe and you set him loose, and that's what we did. And he's come up with all these, uh, I, I would say, originally wild alternatives. And uh, we, we uh, looked at those alternatives and put them through a filter of our planning criteria. There's really three criteria we ran it through. But before we could run it through, we also invited Chris Edwards, your esteemed faculty member, to really help us think through this. And then Jim and, and Lynn and others helped as well, because it's a big, big project, a big decision. And, 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 and so the three criteria really, um, one boils down to flexibility, planning. Planning in long-term flexibility. And an institution like this, you know, people say, well, we're slow and stodgy. Well, guess what? Things change rapidly, and you can't predict what that future is going to bring. So one of the criteria is about flexibility, and you'll hear more about that later. Second one, of course, is about efficiency. How, efficiency, how efficient can we make this, uh, this, this new plant and this new system? And that boils down to the economics. Efficiency, essentially, you know, in the math, comes out in, in, in cost. So cost is a big deal. Um, and the third one is the environment. How can we continue to set an example, all the while optimizing the other two important variables, cost and long-term flexibility? So. Hopefully I'm not too long-winded, but I think it's important context. And now I'm going to turn it over to Joe, and he's going to walk you through uh, a little bit more uh, detailed level of these alternatives and our decision-making criteria. So thank you. So thanks, and I just want to add a little bit uh, to continue on the context that, that Bob mentioned. We're going to be talking about an energy supply system here today, but in looking at Stanford's overall energy scheme and our, our management of energy and environment, you have to look at supply and demand. And as he mentioned, uh, in our new construction program, a lot of our buildings are very efficient, both in water and energy. And we also have programs to retrofit, uh, both on minor capital and major capital uh, ways, existing buildings. So we really have a three-pronged balanced uh, approach to overall energy management on campus and sustainability. Uh, that really uh, does a lot on the demand sides too, but for both new and existing buildings. We're not talking about those today, but it's really important to understand that context, and this is only that, that one third of the supply leg. So the first thing I'd like to do is just give you a quick description of the current energy system. Stanford is a collection of both large and small buildings and has a central district uh, energy system meaning a central energy plant provides heating and cooling services to most of the major buildings. That current system, instead of those buildings having their own heaters and air conditioners on everyone. And that central plant is currently the Cardinal Cogen plant. A lot of you may recognize some of those buildings. They're just around the corner from here. And it's a, uh, built in the 1980s, uh, 1987, 
and it's owned by a third-party company, uh, General Electric Corporation, through the Cardinal Cogeneration subsidiary. And Stanford contracts to buy electricity, heating, and cooling services from it. And that contract ends in 2015. So starting around 2007, 2008, we realized, you know, it really takes five years or more to build a new power plant. This thing's going to be about 28 years old, as you can see by the math, in 2015 when the current contract expires. And there's other pieces of equipment that, that are even older. The backup boilers that provide steam in case the cogen goes down, they were built in the 1950s. And they're 60 years old. So we have some old heating and uh, cooling equipment and a fairly old cogeneration plant. So we knew we better start planning for the next 30 or 40 year horizon. So um, we set about to say, let's, let's go out to 2050 uh, and start from 2015 to 2050 and think what that next 30 or 35 year option would be. But some of the metrics on this, um, it's about 53% efficient in tri-generation efficiency. That means the total energy in over the workout in both heating, cooling, and electricity, the three services there. About 60% of the electricity is um, used by the university, and the rest is exported to the, the regional grid and sold to Pacific Gas and Electric Company. But of course, we use all the thermal services. Um, being a uh, natural gas-fired plant and providing virtually all of our major energy on campus, you can see that's accountable for most of our greenhouse gas emissions really just the combustion of natural gas. A uh, little bit more details, it's a combined cycle a cogeneration plant, uh, meaning that natural gas is fed into the prime turbine and that drives a generator, about 30, 35 megawatts of electricity is produced. Then it goes through a heat recovery steam generator where steam is produced. Additional gas is injected and burnt in this to make even more heat. And the steam then goes through a steam turbine to make another 10 or 15 megawatts of electricity. Hence, we have over 50 megawatts total power. And then some of the steam is used to meet um, campus heating loads, and some is used for steam-powered chillers in the plant. Here's that same cogen plant in uh, profile. And this shows the underground piping network and schematic to the campus. So you have um, electricity produced from the plant. Some of that's sent by our underground high-voltage electric system to all power all the buildings and some is sent off to the grid to PG&E. We have steam produced that's sent to all the buildings. They use the heat they need for heating hot water and, and process steam use like sterilization and so forth. And then that uh, after removing the heat, the steam collapses to condensate and is returned back to the uh, central plant where it's uh, flashed back into steam with heat. The chillers at the central plant, some are electric powered, some are steam powered, make cold water, it's about 56 degrees. Uh, coming back in about 42 degrees going out. So it's like ice water going out to the campus to cool it. We collect the unwanted heat, bring it back at about 56 degrees and through chillers uh, heat it up so it can be, the heat can be evaporated to cooling towers. That uses about 25% of the campus's fresh water supply in that evaporative cooling process. So as the lead in said, you know, we need to start planning for a, a successor to this strategy. And um, some of those reasons are to support the academic mission. As a lot of you know, the hospitals are expanding quite a bit, and they have additional loads that have to be met over the long term in a reliable fashion. We have to find a replacement for the plant just because of its age. We have to find an, an economic uh, uh, energy system, something that anticipates where fuel prices and electricity prices are going and puts us in a good position to be as economic as we can, something that will hedge against uh, uh, unknown price increases in commodities like gas and water. And of course, we want to lead sustainably by example, find innovative ways to produce our energy and, and save water and reduce greenhouse gas impacts along the way. So with all those general goals and needs, we did a whole triage in 2008. We had sustainability working groups, we called, of, of professors who volunteered, students, and our own staff look at all the different kinds of energy technologies that we might use for our next energy system. You know, the crazy things like uh, hydroelectric power, uh, tidal power through the Golden Gate, offshore wind, uh, ocean source cooling, you know, running a pipe from the campus to the bay and use that for cooling. You know, we didn't, we didn't leave any stone unturned, I don't think. We looked for all the ideas we could. And as we were going through that, you know, an idea came up that, well, you know, in between summer and winter, 
in between the heating and cooling season, there's probably a period where there's some overlap of heating and cooling. You know, might we capture some of that waste heat and save it for a night and use it to uh, heat the campus at night while it's being cooled the next day? We take that heat and store it again and then use it to warm the campus at night. And, you know, maybe that would give us 5 or 10% energy savings if we could, on those shoulder periods between summer and winter, capture that waste heat and reuse it. Um, so we said, let's, let's model every hour of the year how much heat is going out of our central plant to the buildings and how much heat we are collecting back via the chilled water system, which if you think of it not as a system for delivering cold, but a system for collecting unwanted heat, makes the comparison a lot easier to understand. So we've got this heat going out and this heat coming back that we're putting out cooling towers. So we mapped it out and we were quite surprised. This was in October of 2009. We finally got all this data together for a whole year that um, we are really heating and cooling the campus a lot uh, at the same time. Here's a chart showing a daily uh, thermal profile for the, the campus. These are the 24 hours of the day, and this is the amount of energy in BTUs. And the blue line shows our cooling pattern. This is a summer day, July. And so you can see it's cooler at night here, as you all know, and then in the daytime it gets warmer and we have to do a lot of air conditioning. And at the same time, we have a fairly consistent need for heating. It can get a little cool at night, and we actually have a little more heating in some of these cool summer nights even. And it drops in the daytime, but we still have uh, a lot of heat use to make hot water, and believe it or not, in the air conditioning process. Um, and I'll explain a little bit why that is. But uh, we mapped it out, and we said, look at all that, that thermal overlap. The area in green represents the total amount of heat that we have coming in or we're throwing away, and the amount of heat that at the same time we're sending out. Why can't we capture that heat and help meet some of that heating demand with it? When we plotted it out for the whole year, you get this chart. These are the months of the year, and below the neutral line is our heating load, and above is our cooling load. So you can see in winter, you know, there's more heating needs, and that drops off in summer. And in summer, the cooling load goes up as you'd expect. The total uh, overlap of heat recovery potential is shown here. And you see it's quite substantial. And what the numbers revealed was that we could take 70% of the heat we're currently wasting to the atmosphere out cooling towers and turn it into hot water, and that could theoretically meet 80% of our annual heating demand. So it was much more substantial than the 5 or 10% we thought. So we really latched onto that idea and started exploring further and, and developed it into the, the project we'll describe today. But we didn't just focus on that one idea. We also wanted to look at all the other possible ideas we could come up with. And on a large scale, we came up with three basic things. We could do what's called separate heat and power. So you have boilers that you feed natural gas or some fuel and they make heat. And you have chillers that could be electric or, or they could use steam. And they make cooling. And then you buy your power off the grid. So that's why it's called separate heating and power, or SHP. And that's shown on some of these options on the right. But then cogeneration is very efficient in situations like this. And so we looked at any number of kinds of cogeneration, including expanding onto our existing plant, putting a new plant in, and staying with steam as the, the heat distribution media to the buildings. And then we said, well, we know hot water is more efficient than sending steam to the buildings because we don't have so much heat leakage in the pipes between the central plant and the buildings and so forth. And so we looked at a lot of hot water options. So in addition to steam options, which are here, we looked at hot water options. And then within the hot water options, we looked at options that include some amount of heat recovery. Now let me explain what these bars are uh, now that you know the different options we looked at. So this is the total net present value cost for 2015 to 2050 of the options. And the red is how much initial capital we'd have to put out, because all of these plants require some form of construction to replace the existing plant. There's, there's nothing free. We can't take this uh, 1987 Volkswagen and make it last to 2050. It's just out of the question. So we have to build something, and that's the capital cost. The blue is our operations and maintenance expense for the 35 years. And the purple or the uh, orange are respective electricity commodity cost or gas commodity cost. So some options which use exclusively electricity or almost all electricity you're buying some electricity, you have a cost for that. Others like Cogen that use mostly gas, you can see most of your fuel cost is, is an orange and gas. And so you can see the, the options range from about 1.2 billion to about 1.4 billion over 35 years of cost. 
We also wanted to look at the environmental attributes on the gross scale of these. And so we ask ourselves, how much greenhouse gas emissions would each option have? How many tons over that total period? And how much water would each one use? So we could get a, a relative perspective on that. And we looked at all these, and there was a number of refinements of the figures, peer reviews by internal and external folks, and so forth, to, to get all the numbers good. And we did sensitivity analysis, even though you can't see that here. And when it came down to it, it looked like this option was our best choice. We had some really good gas cogen options that included some amount of heat recovery. They were almost as efficient and almost as economical as uh, this option. And so it was really a toss up. And the real question for the campus and our board was to gas or not to gas. You have two almost equal options. One will rely on natural gas exclusively for the next 35 years. The other is going to rely on grid electricity and or any renewables we do on site for 35 years. So was there anything that tipped it in the favor? And as Bob mentioned, I think in the end it came down to flexibility. It was recognized that if we start off with an electric plant, as the grid changes, as it gets cheaper or more expensive, there's some risk there. But over time, it likely will get more efficient and more sustainable uh, because of California's AB 32 and other laws. And we knew that, you know, should electricity off the grid ever get out of hand in price or, or something like that, we can always go install a natural gas-fired electricity plant on campus and feed our thermal recovery plant with it. So we had the most options by picking the electric heat recovery plant and preserving options in the future to use natural gas-fired uh, generation as well if we want to. So that's options that are out of the question with this. Whereas one of the cogent options, if we put that in, we've kind of lost our flexibility. You know, we're, we have a, a unit that's going to take a long time to pay for. It's natural gas fired, and so we're, we're kind of uh, assigned to that. So uh, additional questions we looked at was we noticed that, you know, this requires a little bit less capital investment than a cogen plant. And so we said, well, if we were willing to spend the same amount of capital in each of these cases, what could we do with that extra capital? Even though it's debt service and it would come out in the, in the wash and the net present value, we said, what if we took that extra $85 million and, and invested in on-campus uh, photovoltaic power? And we get these options. You can see that has the same capital cost as that. So it's basically taking this option, plus the difference in price between there and there, and investing in photovoltaic power on campus. And so that further reduced the net present value a little bit and increased the environmental attributes. So as you'll see later in the presentation, the board decided to go ahead and do this and then investigate uh, photovoltaic power on campus to see if uh, we can get bids that are economical and could return this net present value that we're looking at. And if so, maybe they'll consider investing in that. So in summary, the, the plant we've uh, picked <laughs> gives us a little bit lower cost than uh, definitely the existing cogen operation, and we believe even a little bit lower than a, a new cogen with a little bit of heat recovery would. And how do we get that? As Bob mentioned, well, we have new equipment that's you know, several generations more efficient than what was available in 1987. So whether we built a new cogen or a new heat recovery plant, we're going to have great efficiency improvements either way because all the equipment's better than it used to be. Free heat. Well, the sun's free too, but you got to buy the solar panel, right? So it's not totally free, but a lot of the heat that we're sending out cooling towers now and we're capturing, the commodity of the heat is free, and so it's only the cost of the machines to then package it and make it useful for the campus that's the extra cost. Uh, but in, in, when it comes out, the cost to do that is cheaper than producing it with natural gas, so uh, it's economic. We're saving a lot of energy loss by moving from steam pipes to hot water pipes. We're savings in operations and maintenance because water pipes, you know, we have about 20 miles of water pipes under the ground for this hot water system we're putting in, and that's about how many miles of steam pipes. It costs a couple million dollars a year and takes a staff of about 10 to maintain those steam pipes. Well, with hot water, it's just like a domestic water system that we have around campus now, our chill water system, and we know from experience, we can go from a staff of, say, 12 to a staff of three or four to maintain water pipes. They're much simpler. They don't have pressure reduction stations, uh, condensate traps, and a lot of these things that you find with steam systems. So there's a, a great deal of operations and maintenance, simplicity, and savings by moving to hot water. And back to the, the uh, flexibility issue, we now have the ability to have a more diverse uh, core fuel source. So in schematic form, here's what it'll do for campus greenhouse gas emissions. 
Here's where we've been the last uh, 25 years or so since 1990. We have a few reductions because of some efficiencies and things and because uh, some of the electricity we're buying is a little cleaner even though most is coming from cogen. Um, and we have some facilities that have been decommissioned and replaced with much more efficient facilities like SOE and GSB. So our building stock, as Bob mentioned, has been great at lowering our demand, even though we've been growing a little bit. Uh, and here's when the hospitals come online. There's a whole bunch of new load for that. So that's why you see this here. And then with some steady growth, we predict that over the long term, our greenhouse gases would be here if we stayed with cogen. And that's because it's natural gas fired. So unless you you know, put carbon capture and sequestration or something on the tail end of that, the emissions would go up as the loads go up. When we put this new system in, we will reduce our emissions to half of what they are today. And that includes the emissions from the off-campus electricity. Folks ask, well, are you counting the electricity you're bringing in off the grid and how much emissions result from the power plants producing it? And yes, we have. Using the average heat rate or the average greenhouse gas factors for that, that power off the grid. So everything's in there, it's fair and equal. And because we're reusing so much waste heat and because the electricity from the grid is getting greener and greener through the renewable portfolio standard requirement that requires the electricity on the grid to be one third renewable by 2020, all those factors are combining to really result in some big greenhouse gas reductions. Now as our loads grow over time, even with the heat recovery plant, you can see we'll slowly go up. Now, if we invest heavily in renewables, that could actually go down some more. That'll remain to be seen, but at least we'll achieve this for sure. So I mentioned water use. About one-fourth of our, our water is consumed at the existing plant. By um, reducing that 70%, we get about an 18% total campus reduction, which will extend our water supply out another 20 years or so. Uh, we've done a lot to reduce water use with conservation and switching to non-potable water sources and we'll continue to do that and our buildings are also very water efficient too. Uh, but eventually we uh, project that with growth it'll, it'll start to inch up again as we've picked a lot of low-hanging fruit there. But we'll get this big step function reduction uh, by stopping the use of water for evaporative uh, heat rejection at the plant. While we've, thank goodness, never had any real steam accidents on campus, they do occur. Steam is a very high energy system and there are occasional accidents around. So while it's not a driving force in the decision, it is a nice collateral benefit that the campus really will be safer without having steam uh, serviced to all the buildings. So here's the new cooling plant. Uh, the cogen will be decommissioned and removed and the new heat recovery plant will be in. And you can see we're taking heat from the uh, cooling system through heat recovery chillers or heat pumps, water to water heat pumps, making hot water and using that for a lot of our heating. We'll still have some natural gas boilers or ground source heat exchange or other alternate means to make the balance of heat that we don't get through heat recovery and that's still to be determined. Uh, but that's the ba basic way the system works. And these are the new pipes that um, Laura will be telling you about we're putting in campus now is the hot water pipes between the new plant and the buildings. This will be in the notes, of course I won't go over here, but for those that want to see the basic uh, layout of the hot, uh, hot water system, the chill water system, and what we call the condenser water system, and the potential ground source heat exchange system we're studying now, this will give you a, a map of how that thing all works. Here's some artist renderings of what the new plant will be. Um, besides the basic heat recovery concept, some of the other uh, interesting things is that the plant will incorporate both hot and cold water storage, uh, thermal energy storage, so that we can selectively capture heat at different times of the day and then use it uh, when it's needed in different times of the day or even different times of the week. So you'll see one hot water tank and then two much bigger chill water tanks. The other interesting thing is that to prove this whole concept would work on a detailed hourly basis beyond any shadow of a doubt and really be able to estimate how much energy it would take, we had to have some way to model how this thing would run throughout the year. Uh, with all these heating and cooling loads going up and down and figure out how much is going to thermal storage, how much is coming out and all this, it was quite complex. So we developed a model to do that that allowed us to design this plant and prove it would work. And we're actually going to turn that into the operating software that will then operate the plant. It'll be like an autopilot that assures everything operates very efficiently. And as we look forward continuously every week at what grid electricity prices are, the software will always figure out when's the best time to do the work and when time is the best time to take or put from thermal storage. Here's a plan view of the plant. 
Here's the hot water tank and the two cold water tanks. Folks ask why these are so big compared to that. Uh, chill water systems only have about a 15 degree delta T or change in temperature between supply and return. And so, uh, and hot water has 30, 40, or 50 degrees. So the hot water differential temperatures uh, that you use, it can store a lot more BTUs per volume at, at 30 degrees per gallon instead of 15 degrees per gallon, as it were. So that's why we need a lot more volume of chilled water than we do hot water storage. Um, these will be our heat recovery chillers, our administration building, our conventional chillers and boilers for those little balances of energy that the heat recovery system won't cover. And there's a new campus substation as well to power all this plus the campus because our substation was really beyond capacity just like our power plant. Overall components of the project, it's a $438 million project of about half of that is for this new energy facility. A good chunk is for the new hot water pipes and then we have 12% for the new substation. A couple of the options we're looking at as I mentioned were photovoltaics. We've done detailed studies of where we might be able to put these uh, on our lands that satisfy a lot of our land use issues and, and work from an engineering perspective. And we've put out a request for proposals to all the major uh, solar firms in August, got responses back October 10th, and we're currently evaluating those. Uh, we're meeting November 15th, the internal evaluation team, to see what we have and see if there might be an opportunity there for Stanford. And then we'll move on to take to Bob and Jack and others the, uh, what we get and see if there's something there for the university. And as we mentioned, ground source heat exchange. So as um, you saw in the original slide, there's still some heat here and here in winter that uh, we can't get from heat recovery. And so we've put natural gas boilers in the plant to be able to provide that if we can't find a better way to get it. And those boilers also serve as a backup if our heat recovery chillers go offline and things like that. Uh, likewise, we still have some heat in summer that we can't find a home for. As you can see, we're using all of it that we can, but there's no more heat load on campus here, so we have to have a way to get rid of that heat. And so we have evaporative cooling towers at the plant that we can use to reject that heat, but we also are looking at ground source heat exchange for that. So in winter, we could take these heat recovery chillers that we already have and basically suck some heat out of the ground by pumping cool water out of the ground, passing it through the heat recovery chiller, extracting heat, and putting even colder water back in the ground. And in summer, we can reverse that process, take some of the extra heat we don't have, put it in the ground, and extract uh, cooler water back out. So uh, we've modeled that with the help of uh, Professor Roland Horn and one of his graduate students, uh, uh, Morgan Ames. And uh, they and our consultants say that this looks engineering feasible for the campus. So we've just started a phase two study. We'll be drilling some boring holes around campus to map the groundwater hydrology, uh, hydrogeology, and do some testing and work more with the regulatory agencies to see if we can advance this concept that's something that's uh, economical and also be acceptable environmentally. Those are all the grand ideas. Now the tough part is building it, and that's what Laura is going to tell you how we're going to do. Joe gets to tell you about the exciting vision, and I'm going to tell you about the challenging logistics and how we're going to disrupt you <laughs> during this time. Uh, so just a little bit about the implementation. As Joe mentioned, it's, it's really four components, four projects, that the way we look at it. One is the replacement central energy facility. And this is a new structure that we've just started doing the grading for, the excavation. And you've probably noticed the traffic of dirt trucks um, headed out towards Sand Hill Road that this has created. This facility is out by the Environmental Health and Safety Facility and um, will be ongoing through 2015. The replacement high voltage substation, as Joe showed you on the plan, will also be, it will be adjacent to the energy facility. And this facility will, it will replace the majority of the substation at Via Ortega and Panama. Um, not 100%, but um, quite a bit of that substation will be able to then go away and be that site can be repurposed. Um, then the challenging part, um, the new hot water distribution system. And probably you've seen this around campus mostly. This is the 20 miles of pipe that Joe has mentioned. Um, we've finished three and a half miles of underground pipe um, from the start this summer, this past summer. And you've seen that in small fenced areas all around campus. We usually have 
four or five different areas mobilized at the same time, and you see them marching down pathways and lawns and um, streets. Um, that distribution system also includes two other components, a um, process steam plant, and this is for steam needs, um, non-heat steam needs for equipment and um, lab use, and that's predominantly in the School of Medicine. So there's a small steam plant that we're building um, that will also serve that need. And in the temporary, we have heat exchange stations, five heat exchange stations around campus that will convert steam to hot water in localized neighborhoods until we're ready to convert the whole system to hot water. And the last piece is the building conversions. And, and this you will also notice as we go through 155 buildings that now accept steam. We need to convert those one at a time, um, maybe a few at a time, uh, to accept hot water. And those range from very simple buildings that um, we just need to change the equipment in the mechanical room and go to very complex buildings like some of our housing buildings that have steam radiators. And those are much more invasive conversions. So here's the overall map. Um, every building here that is highlighted is one of the buildings, one of those 155 buildings that will be converted. We have them organized by color, and you can see just barely one, two, three, four, and five are the temporary heat exchange stations. Uh, there's, the first one is in over a Memorial Way. And the red area here was our test area. So we started working a little more than a year ago on the red area and have converted most of those buildings and done that underground work. And we use that as a way to learn some lessons and become more efficient and think about how we want to do the rest of the campus. Um, as we move forward through the rest of these, we'll have electrical and thermal shutdowns in these buildings as we move through converting them. You can also see here all of these lines representing the places that we will be taking out steam and putting in hot water pipe underground. Um, here over by eh and as, as I mentioned on West Campus, is the new Central Energy Facility. And here is, where are we? In here is the steam plant, just right there. It's not shown. Um, in order to help communicate these disruptions, we've developed a website. And this website helps you go through a snapshot in time. So you're able to use um, this navigation here to choose a date. And it will show you by green, red, and blue where we are in the process. So the greens are those that are already completed. And this is a snapshot in the middle of October where we were in terms of red. And if you, um, in the website, if you hover over any of those, they'll give you a more detailed logistics plan of that neighborhood so you can understand any detours to bike traffic, pedestrian traffic, et cetera. Um, and also give you an idea of when we will be working in the future in various areas. For more information, I would um, contact your building manager, your zone manager, or you can, through the website, contact our project managers, and they'll give you much more specific information if you have an event planned, if you are concerned about construction in a particular area, etc. A little bit about schedule. The underground piping, as I mentioned, started in June, and that will continue through June of 2015. The building conversions, we started just a few in June. Um, those will start in earnest at the first of the year and continue through June of 15 as well. And the central energy facility, we've started the grading just this month and will be complete in April of 2015. Just a little bit about disruption mitigation. This is not the kind of project that we'll do and no one will notice. So we're certainly going to be working all around um, our pathways, our parking lots, our buildings. And we want to make that as easy on campus operations as possible. And so we're trying to um, get enough advance notice, do these kinds of outreach, work with building managers so we can plan shutdowns in advance. Um, we're looking at doing night work in several locations. So where there are places where it's more advantageous to work at night, we've been doing that. Uh, there are some places where, obviously, where we have dorms or housing and we're not working at night. Um, but we're trying to be flexible in terms of work hours in order to accommodate different needs on campus. 
We're also looking at where we have other capital projects happening. So for example, Stern Housing was renovated this summer and we teamed up with them and got our work done while we were while they were already working. So we're trying to be opportunistic in that way. We're using our existing tunnels and infrastructure where possible. And we're also using a um, prefabricated pipe, a pre-insulated pipe that allows the process to go a little bit faster, allows the trench to be open a little bit less time, and hopefully minimizes that disruption. So I'm going to turn Great, this over to, to Jack. So if we could ask our panel to come up and Sit on these chairs here. For, uh, I, we're interested in your questions. Um, and uh, before we do that, though, as you can see, this is a huge undertaking. Uh, it's been many years in the uh, works, and we've been very fortunate to have uh, the guidance and the counsel of some of the obviously uh, most important leaders in this field. Um, so I would just be interested initially uh, with our faculty to really uh, ha hear, hear a few comments from them about their thoughts about the project and the process. I'm going to start down with, with Chris, and then we'll get to your questions. OK. Um, can you go back to the bubbles of Mars? So uh, for, for those of you who know me, you know I'm a stickler about uh, efficiency. And I'm not a big fan of CHP efficiency combined heat and power uh, because heat and work are polar opposites. Work has no entropy transfer and heat has the maximum entropy transfer per unit of energy. So summing those two and dividing by the fuel use is a silly thing to do. So I'm not a big fan of that. Um, the way to do that correctly is to do the exergy efficiency, put everything on a work equivalent basis. Uh, and so I want to talk about that um, a little bit. Uh, if you look at, uh, it, that's fine. Uh, if you look at these various options, I guess a couple of points I, I want to make on this. First, and Joe didn't mention this, but he knows this very well because he did the analysis. The uncertainty associated with natural gas cost, uh, carbon price, uh, and cost of electricity on the grid, particularly with a 33% renewable portfolio standard, are huge. Right? So if you look at the difference in these options, my personal take on this is that those uncertainties absolutely swamp the differences that you see here. They're much, much bigger. So you have many things that economically look about the same uh, across this. If you think of the various options, though, this is sort of the cogen option. This would be a different kind of a cogen option than traditionally, in large part because this move to hot water uh, on the campus, which is a great idea, it's absolutely the right thing to do to get away from the steam system and do hot water, actually gives you a special opportunity for how you do cogen in that what would normally be a loss from a cooling jacket of big reciprocating natural gas engines actually becomes the opportunity to heat your buildings to make 170F water. So what would normally be a loss or that you might do with a, a gas turbine based cogen system actually makes uh, an unusual system particularly attractive and particularly efficient. So if you do uh, this option in here, you could actually be over 50% exergy efficiency, which is a really good system. It's a good system because of the match between the cogen system um, and the campus and the switch and doing the heat pumping that's an intrinsic part of that. If you do the, uh, the market-based system, this is actually also very efficient too. This would be somewhere in the mid-40s uh, overall. So it's not quite as efficient on an exergy basis. On the other hand, the point is correct. It doesn't tie us to natural gas that we go out into the market. And one of the things that the uh, Board of Trustees said very clearly was, leave footprint there, so if we decide that long-term we should go back to natural gas, we can do that. And so we don't have that option shut down. So this is actually a very elegant and efficient option too. And if it's done with ground source heat exchange, it's superb, in my opinion. Thermodynamically, it's just a wonderful system to do. If it's done without ground source heat exchange, and those boilers have to go on those two tails down at the bottom, that's not so good, because the last thing you want to do is burn natural gas to make 170F water. Okay, so a boiler like that will have, on a lower heating value basis, over 90% efficiency first law, but it has an exergy efficiency of 8%. That's not a good use of natural gas. But if you pull off ground source heat exchange so that you're pumping that out of the aquifer, if we make that, that's not really an issue. The gas usage now goes down to the point where it's very, very low, and you have a really elegant system. So there's some tough things to, to work through in this. I think the differences relative to uncertainty in terms of economics I mean, how can you tell? So it tends to go in the direction of flexibility, so I, I absolutely agree with that. 
And if you pull off the ground source heat exchanger, maybe even add some of the PV into that. PV is not about efficiency, right? You are bringing a resource in, it's solar energy, and that has a very high exergy. We convert that at a relatively low efficiency, but it's very renewable and it doesn't have carbon. So we're making a different choice there, and it's a non-equivalent choice, and I'm perfectly okay with that to redeploy the capital. But there are many excellent choices on here, including some that are very elegant if we pull them off. John? I was actually planning on going last like last time. Um, so uh, I was brought in to what was then called the Blue Ribbon Panel, which I think Jim Sweeney was chairman of with the rest of us faculty guys in 2007 to 2009. And, we looked at this mammoth report that Joe's group had produced at that time, and I remember saying, geez, this is interesting, but I wonder if it will ever work, uh, both concept conceptually and operationally. Actually, I think Laura, uh, in our last performance, uh, Laura uh, convinced me that uh, she could take care of almost any operational details that needed to get uh, done. So uh, for me, uh, so looking at the project, um, Obviously, as Chris just artfully demonstrated, the energetics are complicated. I mean, it seems like simple hardware at points, but the way things are linked together, it's actually quite a complicated system with lots of off-ramps and options to pursue very bad or very bad, uh, very good um, uh, alternatives. The economics are equally uh, complicated, uh, in case you missed what Chris said. Uh, natural gas prices and electricity prices off the grid and cost for new PV technologies, and so on and so on, uh, probably dwarfed by an order of magnitude of uh, the, the uh, differences in the base uh, kind of expected value cost. And that does, of course, lead to uh, both the systems approach, which the team has been able to implement pretty artfully, and then analytically to this notion of um, risk management being the most important thing. So what you want to avoid, um, and we've seen, heard a couple of examples are, are uh, kind of lock in to one bad uh, solution that the economics or the technology turns out differently or there's rebellion in the streets as people are inconvenienced and you're stuck with a bad situation for 30 or 40 years. Uh, but mostly from my perspective, what I, what, I liked about, what I like about this project up till now, and I convinced Laura will bring it, uh, bring it home, um, is it really to me as a demonstration of a university at its best where uh, you have people from multi-disciplines and multi-institutions. We have a lot of institutional diversity around campus kind of working together constructively, not always agreeing. Uh, this story about how Chris was brought in, I think that was sometimes uh, people pushing Chris, sometimes Chris swimming towards the shark, uh, 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 and so on. But I think it was all kind of in the family. So in, in, uh, in honor of the Giants' recent victory, I think it wasn't always pretty, but my, my God, uh, having been out the last of the analytics the last year and a half or so, I think the end result is quite a nice um, uh, kind of demonstration for the rest of the world of how to do this kind of research and what kind of uh, good Yankee ingenuity can come out. I'm sure both sides of the presidential um, race would like to take credit for a neat project <laughs> like this. Uh, so uh, I, w I just wish that uh, more of this kind of thing was going on at the federal level. Uh, in, in, in a, if there had been this kind of thing going on, I'm sure New York would not be sitting there today uh, wondering if the combination of sea surge and very um, heavy rains uh, there, Bloomberg actually did a study like this, which showed that in this case, the backup drainage system for New York is, guess what, the sewers. Uh, if it doesn't quite uh, handle it, you know what happens then. So I wish uh, the, uh, the governments of the world would follow Stanford's good example as in, in, embodied in this project. Lynn? So I can see that we're gonna cut into the reception time if you let all of us faculty members hold forth at great length. So um, I will just be very brief and just say, you know, I think this, this project is a good example for all of us to think about how energy is woven into our lives. This is 
a project that involves all of us. It involves our buildings. It involves the heat and lights and the air conditioning. Um, it's going to involve how we uh, navigate around the campus, at least for a time. Um, so energy is woven into every aspect of uh, modern lives. And we can do the kinds of things that we can do at a place like Stanford because we have energy available and can put it to work productively. Uh, but we have an obligation, just like the rest of the world, to do that as efficiently as we can and in a way that respects the fact that uh, we all live on this planet uh, and uh, need to take care of it. Uh, the energy transitions that need to happen in this century are truly one of the grand challenges we humans need to face. Um, this project doesn't solve every problem, but it's a big step in the right direction. Um, and the fact that we can do it and save uh, money, uh, which for heaven's sakes we can put productively to use in all kinds of other things that we can do, that's an example of the best kind of, of engineering and cooperation around the campus. Uh, and so I I'm, I'm just will congratulate uh, uh, Joe and his team and all the others who have put so much effort into this. Um, this is a really big positive step for us. Jim. Thank you. And I'd, I'd like to um, echo the desire to have ethanol in the right place. And I understand there's wine out there. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, go back to, I want to go back to something that Bob started with. And I think is a very important thing to understand. This is not unidimensional thinking. Uh, this is an issue of how to pay attention to the economics, how to pay attention to the environmental consequences, how to make sure the whole system uh, is financial risk management, and I want to come back to that because that has a lot to do with the options to adjust. Um, a little sense of the security in there, although I, I think the probability of the of, of the uh, steam explosion is, is pretty, pretty small. Uh, and then um, in a bigger context, if you all see the type of buildings we're going into, it's buildings that have uh, an integration of a quality of life and quality of experience. High performance is a word used earlier. Being able to take into account all of those characteristics. So, so that, that's been done very, very well. So it's not simply optimizing for either the economics or the environment or the security um, or the quality of life of doing all of the things, but taking them on all together. Let me just go to this graph. I just want to point out just a couple of things about difference. First, this, this heat recovery is a winner. The, the fact that we're understanding that there's a, an energy efficiency in the whole thing um, by, by being able to recover some of the waste heat is across the board, no matter how we look at it, that's a winner. And, 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 the right, and, and Joe and others are doing the right thing. They're going forward with that no matter what. What we don't know is a couple of things. What's going to happen with natural gas price? You know, we have a revolution. It's a game changer now in natural gas. Um, but that price can go up. It can go down. And, and in a cogeneration, a gas-based system, we really don't know whether that's going to get a lot smaller or a lot, lot, a lot larger. So that's a key uncertainty here. If we have the uh, PVs, we really don't know what the, the, the cost of the uh, renewables are going to be, the photovoltaics. So, so that's a sort of uh, uncertainty that's, that's really facing us right now. Then I want you to notice these little boxes there and, and these little water fa faucets. Those are the resource users, the, the water and the carbon dioxide that's, 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 that's you, being used. And how we value what value that we place on, on differences in carbon dioxide releases is something that I don't think we've debated fully in the campus, and that's going to make a difference in the actions, and similarly how valuable it is to pre preserve water. So 
I'm very pleased that we're going to a system right now that is going to leave the ability to work out some of these key uncertainties in this time of pretty remarkable energy transitions now and environmental transitions. And we, Stanford is put into a situation they can't not make a decision. They could delay a little bit, but it's best to just get it up front. And I think it's done something where the important thing where you don't need to risk manage is being done. And it's pretty intelligent risk management going on to take into account the central uncertainties. And I'll end at that point. Great. So now we have uh, a few minutes here to, to take your questions. And I'm going to pass the mic to uh, the, the panelists. But are there any questions out there that? Yes, Richard. Sure. Of some of the water that's used domestically. So, is there a replacement for that? Yeah. So, the question was uh, you understand that the existing plant currently uses rewater, or currently reuses water, and is that going to be uh, part of this plan as well? Yes, what she's talking about is our reclaimed water facility put in in 2008. And in those evaporative cooling towers, we have to bleed some of the water off as the minerals uh, get too thick in them. And we had been putting that in the sewer. Instead, we put in a facility to clean it up and use it in the science engineering quad for some of the domestic uses in the bathrooms. So we're looking at right now how to replace that and how to keep that facility going. Uh, it's going to have to be moved along with the central plant. So even though we'll have you know 80% less uh, water available or, or wasted water, I'll call it, at the central plant, we can still use what little we have in the cooling towers there. And we're looking at using other non-potable sources like uh, surface water runoff, storm drainage capture, other non-potable water, putting it through that plant to continue to have a reclaimed water uh, facility on campus. In the red jacket. Are there any plans for making this facility available for teaching purposes, for walkthroughs, or for tours? So uh, yeah, I can. The, the question was, was there uh, any uh, capacity for teaching or any any program for teaching out there. Um, we did consult with uh, Dean Matson early on and Dean Plummer, and um, what we've provided in that administrative bar, which you might remember from the plan, is some flexible space that we'll be able to use as we operate the plant, but also will be uh, easily adapted to um, classes or to visits out How there. How many of you have been on a tour of Cardinal Cogent? Oh, cool. Great. Say that as, uh, as a person who's taken a lot of students through Card Cardinal Trojan, they do a great tour. So if you, you guys have a high standard to measure up to. <laughs> yes. Add one, one other thing. Um, for those of you who want to look at the decision making and the process, you know, there's lots of things that are available through the web that you can allow you to see how what was really behind this decision. Always more details are available from Joe than will than most of us ever want to have to go through. Um, but those are educational in themselves. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Congratulations on a tremendous project. I see this as being a, a wonderful example for campuses and other types of communities around the country. And, uh, uh, my question is on the, the flexibility you have generating electricity as your major source, I think is a, is a really wise decision with lots of flexibility for Stanford to distribute generation right here on campus in the future. Uh, I think you've got a lot more chances to electricity generation and biopower generation for you know staying with renewables. My question is really on the solar element. I saw the, the plots, it looks like they're mostly across Foothill Expressway up in the up in the foothills. If it won't you be dependent on PG and E in that scenario because my understanding of the law is that you can't cross a right of way without you know, you have to be a utility to cross the right of way, which which obviously Foothill Expressway is a right of way. A, a couple comments I'd like to make on your general question and then technical piece Joe can probably speak to. Uh, first of all, those plots you saw on the map, it's, it is accurate to report that the places we're investigating are on, say, the western side of 280. 
Uh, please understand there are significant hurdles to get through and a lot of thinking that needs to go into even imagining getting something approved in this community. Uh, even if it's green, even if it's doing great things for the environment, neighbors don't like to see, you know, arrays of, of photovoltaics, which, which we can understand. So there's a lot of hurdles and issues we need to get through. Uh, besides just the RFPs and the, and the bids we just received, there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into imagining making that happen. Uh, with regard to the specific question that you have, we are planning to um, potentially bring a direct line that we would own and operate. So we wouldn't be paying tariffs or a wheeling fee or some sort of fee that, say, PG&E, who owns the grid, would require of us. I don't know if there's any legal uh, yeah, I'll just restriction. Clarify the transmission line, we're looking at three different options, but the power would all be, quote, behind the meter. It's just as if it was a PV on the roof. So it doesn't have to hit the grid per se and then come back to Stanford. It never even touches the grid. It's all on our land and all behind the meter. So we don't see any issues it's with that. Crossing the road is the issue. Yeah, yeah crossing, crossing the road the through. Well, we do have rights underneath 280. There's tunnels, and so we have rights to get through there. But, but Foothill Expressway is a right away as well. Yeah, and we, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't see that as a big issue. We have lots of utilities okay. that cross over Foothill, frankly, water in, in particular. Yeah, back there in the, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, any type of system to collect information or data points uh, for after construction to either at least meet the models or the studies or in, a, in the obvious to exceed that as well? Yeah, so I mentioned we had developed this, uh, this software that will basically be an autopilot to run the plant. All the data that's collected and used by that model will be stored, you know, forever as it were, or for a very long period. And we'll always be doing backfitting. So uh, we'll always uh, be taking the data, rerunning with the model, and saying, if we could have run the plant perfectly, how much energy would we have used? And then we'll plot that against how much we did use. And that uh, backfit of the model and monitoring and verification of performance will be a key attribute of running the plant in the future to make sure it always lives up to its expectations. All that data will be available. We plan as part of the, the teaching and learning process to have kiosks at the plant and to have web-enabled access of data for all of you, for the whole community, that can see the data and how the plant's running. There's a whole separate project we're doing called uh, UMBRS, Utility Management Building Reporting Sustainability System, where we hope to have that plus a lot of other campus uh, resource usage and, and sustainable information web-enabled and made public uh, for students and others to see. So yes, that, that will be a key part. What's the how close to Carnot efficiency are the heat pumps going to be? I can tell you the coefficient of performance uh, is going to be over six, and that's the sum of the heating and cooling coefficient. So we're looking at about 1.33 kilowatt hours per ton of cooling uh, and simultaneous production of 170 degree water. When you add that. Uh, together, the heating and cooling COP, it comes out to about 6.1 to 6.2. So in our original modeling, we assumed it would take 1.51 to 1.56 kilowatt hours per ton of heat pumping. We actually have some really novel machines that the company York we've, we've picked to do this. They've engineered some machines for us that for our application are, are far about 20% more efficient than we thought, and we have a guaranteed performance uh, in the contract there. I can't translate on the fly to Carnot efficiency, but but those are the basic engineering metrics. They're probably close to 50% of our bill. Last time I looked, they were really bad. And so that summer heat load is what's concerning me. I mean, you know, there's a lot more uh, need for cooling than heating in the summer. It's much less balanced. And does that, the, does the need to dissipate that heat somehow, either by evaporative cooling or ground sourcing, get better or worse with this system? So if you pull up the ground source heat exchange, then that's your answer to the summer, and that's your answer to the winter. Sure, sure. And those boilers don't, don't go on, and we're not vaporizing water on the backside. If not, then you've got to do something to hold that COP, right? Because if you start to let that temperature come up because you have to do rejection, you won't be getting 3.5, you'll be getting 3.0 or something smaller, right? Because you'll have to work between a bigger delta T or evaporate water. So it'll be a trade-off there. As far as the evaporative component of it, or that blue part, that today is going, uh, that's being processed by a combination of, of steam chillers and electric chillers. Um, the new, the new uh, chillers we have are far more efficient than anything we have at the current plant. Uh, we're looking at um, you know, under 0.5 kW per ton, which you know, most of you in this business know is where the state of the art is. 
We're looking at about 0.4 kilowatt hours per ton to reject that heat uh, in summer if we don't send it to the ground with, with heat pumps at conventional electric uh, cooling. Okay, I, we have time for one more question, so I'm going to take a random so this is kind of a land use question, but it looks from the map that you're installing the new facility on an area north of the golf course. Uh, and I wondered, is that a greenfield site? And if so, um, what will be the fate of the current cogen plant when it's decommissioned? Will that be turned back into um, an open area on campus, or will that be, you know, a site for new construction of buildings? Will the net loss plan be positive? Yeah. So, you know, the currency of land, and, and are we are consuming more land by doing this? So the current use of the land where we're proposing and actually starting to build this new plant is the practice golf facility near the stable site near the second fairway of the golf course, all right? So we're, we are uh, taking that temporary use called the golf practice facility and using that for the central plant. The existing uh, central plant, our, our, uh, our proposal and our costs are to, to remove it, demolish it, and we have a couple of plans we're thinking about. Uh, one would be, or two buildings, one or two buildings that fits into the master plan of the quads as they go to the west, I'll call it. Um, but, but, but there is a net open space increase as it relates to that site, clearly, right? So we go more vertical with, a, with an academic building and then afford ourselves to create open space or garden space or active space outdoors around that building. Uh, so that's the game plan. That answer your question? Just one quick point. The new plant and footprint uses about 75% of the space that the existing plant does. So it's actually a smaller plant than if we were to build a new cogen plant, to put it another way. So we'll be around after this for uh, follow-up questions, but uh, Jim did want to make one final point, and then I think we have to, to wrap this up. So, A quick process point, because I've gone back a long time at Stanford, and the traditional way of doing major changes was the facilities or somebody in the administration would plan something and go ahead and not bring in the faculty expertise. Starting um, with, with the sustainability study that we done a while ago, we had the staff develop something, Joe and others developed something and pulled in a group of the faculty to work on it. And I think at the end of the time, we, they went back and forth and really improved it. This is what happened again. Um, uh, Joe and, and um, Bob and others pulled a group of faculty members in Chris Edwards put an amazing amount of time and effort in it, and he's just just invaluable in this. But but this really is was a process that was able to pull in the talents from several different groups of of people, and I think as a result we've come out a lot better than what used to be the old processes at Stanford. So thank you all for doing it this way. Thanks. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.